Live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Hi, folks. Cesar here, back with you. Happy New Year to those I haven't seen. It's been a little bit of a while. We have a great show this evening. Uh, some great topics, some great guests. Uh, we're going to be talking about the latest races in the Virginia State House race, as well as a issue uh, that's facing not only Northern Virginia, but quite frankly, a lot of communities across the country in terms of uh, housing. But first, uh, I really want you to meet my, my dear friend. We've become very good friends, full disclosure, over this past campaign season. Uh, this gentleman, he is a young man with a lot of energy, a lot of visions for the future. Uh, you're you're going to like to talk and hear from Ibrahim Samira, Dr. Ibrahim Samira. He is the candidate, uh, the Democratic candidate for the 86th state house of delegate race and that's coming up soon we'll be talking about that but in the first segment i really just want to say welcome my friend well thank you for having me i'm we so excited that you are here <laughs> we're going to talk we're going to let the folks get to know you a little bit uh first segment then we'll talk a little bit more about your positions but honestly man thank you uh, i just want to say to the folks that don't know you're first generation american yes. I, I love that and i love your story uh, of your family story man how you became to be here. I just want to give you the opportunity to kind of share that with us, man. Well, absolutely. I, I'm excited to be here. Uh, hello to everybody in Fairfax, of course. Uh, uh, you know, I, I did have a, a, a great start to my life with parents that are immigrants and that sure. worked extremely hard and mm -hmm. uh, that came here for education. And uh, uh, I grew up in Chicago. That's where, uh, that's where they were. Uh, my father was uh, uh, in pursuit of uh, higher education, a master's and PhD in political science and economics, and my mother a special education degree uh, and a master's. And uh, in their pursuit, they cared a lot about the community, and I was mm -hmm. very much a part of their uh, uh, their life in that moment and, and their pursuit of that uh, that form of internal happiness because of uh, from giving to others, uh, giving back to community, mm -hmm. and uh, and. Uh, all came to an abrupt stop uh, when I was in middle school uh, mm -hmm. when the uh, Bush administration decided to uh, not allow my father re-entry into the United States. Yeah, now a little bit of detail about how did that come about? Yeah, wow. well, uh, let's backtrack a little for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with uh, my father being a, such a, a, a great activist and, and organizing mm -hmm. so well, he actually had uh, registered 50,000 uh, Americans to vote in the state of Illinois at the time. Mm -hmm and uh, gaining national accolade uh, for, for all sorts of uh, great things that he was doing uh, and uh, culminating into uh, you know, a moment where 9-11 uh, happened mm -hmm. and uh, the Bush administration had its eyes on war and mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were targeting uh, Iraq at the time and, and mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, go in that direction through Afghanistan. I don't know uh, how they did it, but they did it. And uh, along the way, they wanted to make sure to stifle any opinion that was against uh, the Bush administration's move in that direction. My father yeah. was one of those people yeah. and uh, developed a big X on his back uh, uh, for, by the Bush administration and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the passage of the Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. uh, enabled the Bush administration to target all sorts of people, sure. and uh, that was one of one of them was my father, and mm -hmm. uh, they they uh, they they used the Patriot Act to deny him reentry, mm -hmm. uh, and th that led to uh, separation. That led to uh, my family having to reunite uh, in Jordan, where my father was uh, to live, uh, mm -hmm. because he couldn't come back to the United States, wow. and. Uh, we had yeah. to battle it out in the legal system, uh, mm -hmm. reaching all the way to the Seventh Circuit Court. Uh, and uh, 11 years later, after that incident, my father became the first to defeat the Patriot Act in American history, setting precedent. Uh, and the person who ruled the majority opinion actually was a, a Bush-appointed judge. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, the circle of justice in the United States does, uh, does come full circle usually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it comes with a lot of challenges, a lot of pains along the way. Uh, oh pains that have to do with uh, getting a good education, getting uh, good health care, uh, my parents getting good jobs, uh, being able to, to take care of us uh, and, 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 and give us all the attention that we needed uh, to succeed fully. And of course, difficulties for me personally as uh, an American living in a country bordering Iraq. Uh, yeah, and for the record, you yeah. are a U.S. citizen. Absolutely. Right? So you're, you're having to go to another country to be reunited just to keep fighting to come back home. 
That, that's like in, insanely yeah. crazy for me and for most people that hear that. It's, it's absolutely painful and, and you know, the pain doesn't just disappear. It definitely diminished a lot since you know, the moment it happened, but, uh, but it persists. And it, mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely a driving factor for me to, to, to be as active as I am in the community. Yeah. Uh, but you know, having, to be, having to fight to get back to your own country, right. uh, something I'm a natural citizen uh, yeah. uh, of, uh, uh, and uh, some, a country that, that I, I wanted to be in, I, I was, uh, you know, the, the story that keeps uh, repeating in my head uh, when I think about these things is uh, how uh, in middle school I was so addicted to basketball and yeah. uh, I had developed a skill and uh, made it to the middle school team and we were a competitive team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the last memory I have before leaving uh, the U.S. Uh, for Jordan to be with my father and so our family can reunite uh, was, was hitting a game-winning shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and for my middle school team and, uh, you know, just enjoying that, that satisfaction of, of being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, given this importance as a middle schooler, yeah. uh, you know, making the team win and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that, that it's every last kid's dream, right? right, right, <laughs> right. Like in the last second jump shot, right? Exactly. Who hasn't practiced that? Yeah, exactly. And then two weeks later, right after that, that's when my father was not allowed to re-entry into the United oh, States. So, yeah. Uh, and, and it was just a, a crazy moment for me to reflect on at that point where, uh, you know, how the hell did I get here? And mm -hmm. I had no real explanations because I didn't understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and how old were you at the time? Yeah, I was a sixth grader okay, and sixth uh, grade. I was at love in years old, uh, okay. almost. Uh, and then how, how long were you out of the country before you all came back as a family? So rounded up to seven years, uh, graduated high school in Jordan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Definitely continued mm -hmm. my passion for basketball. It was sort mm -hmm. of my way of keeping connected to the United States, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a lot of struggles along the way, of course. Being and I was, as I was touching upon, being discriminated against for being an American. I mean, abroad. Mm -hmm. You know, let's not forget that yeah. the, the, the burden of living in a country sure. that borders a country that's war-ridden because of right. the Bush administration's decision to illegally go into Iraq, yeah. and uh, you know, being in that 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 whole uh, uh, situation, having to deal with. Uh, being called El Amriki, uh, you know, the, the given, given nicknames and, and being bullied in school for that and mm -hmm. having to overcome an accent, developing it's, it. It's and, interesting because yeah. people never think of it the other way. No. Right? You always think of it being this way, but it's actually the opposite way, and it's a little bit different for some people. Yeah, and, 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 and mm -hmm. let's not forget, of, of course, the impact <clears throat> that, that, I, that was on my life there because yeah. of the war. Half a million refugees came to Jordan oh. uh, from Iraq, and that burdened the economy. That burdened the school systems, and that added just more economic burden on my family. Uh, so we were dealing, we're trying to buy a house uh, you know, right before the, uh, the war, and, uh, and it, uh, excuse me, right, right after the war, and it was really expensive mm -hmm. uh, having to buy one uh, out there—not a house, just an, actually an apartment—and skyrocketed prices. The cost of living being the the second highest in the entire Middle East. Uh, largely because of, of the influx of refugees into the country where oh. there's not enough resources uh, and there's not enough uh, 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 things for everyday people to buy. And so uh, it's, it's an overburdened uh, system and, and yeah. you know, it, it continued, it continued uh, uh, and it continues to hurt my family. It, the, these, these wars and, 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 and what they do, it, Syria uh, it ha also has uh, added a million refugees, the war there. So you're mm. talking about, you know, my connectedness from I'm just a, a person here in the United States yeah. living in Chicago yeah. uh, and, and, and my, my father being at the forefront of fighting for everyday Americans' lives uh, to having to deal with the worst of uh, the, the American government's uh, impact all across the world, concentrated. Cause effect. Cause I mean, just directly there. And, um, so what was, yeah. what was that like then? So you get the word, you get the decision, your family's complete able to enter back into the U.S. Like, what, what happens at that point? What happens going forward from So there? I was in college okay. when my father was, uh, well, actually in dental school, when I, my mm -hmm. father was allowed to re-entry into the United States. So you had, you, you had already come back? Yeah, okay. I, had, I had had to separate again yeah. wow. uh, and, and leave my family. And it is a heart-trenching moment. I, again, I'm leaving my family to pursue a higher education to get education to start with because I couldn't get the education that I wanted in Jordan because yeah. it's, it's expensive to get an education. Mm -hmm. My parents were not making the income that was necessary to get me into dental school uh, in Jordan. Mm -hmm. My passion to become a dentist mm -hmm. uh, was there and it, it, couldn't, it couldn't translate. So I had to come and pick up loans 
uh, uh, to become a dentist here in the United yeah. States. So, you know, <laughs> so, wow. you know, having to come yeah. back, uh, luckily enough, American University gave me a full scholarship to study political science. Uh, I, I, I had to work my butt off uh, when mm -hmm. I was in high school, had to graduate at the top of my high school class and uh, uh, have to, had to overcome the the language barrier of, of the fact that I left the United States in sixth grade. So I had mm -hmm. to work my sure. English language skills up from mm -hmm. sixth grade to twelfth grade on my own in a country where the first language is definitely not English right. and mm -hmm. uh, get good scores on the SAT, be a, just like a, a, an average, the average American student and you know, somehow make it over here with it on a full scholarship. And so mm -hmm. Those struggles are extremely real, uh, and and uh, and I still I still am burdened by them. I have half a million dollars in debt from dental school, uh, and and that's that within itself is 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 uh, you know a shocker of my life because uh, you know who knew that you, pursuing a career that is direly needed in the United States uh, sure. dentistry extremely expensive is mm -hmm. is going to be. Uh, just the service itself is very, it's going to be hard to get, that hard to get, uh, to start with, that you have to pick up that many loans and the interest rates being so high on, on student loans and, yeah. uh, you know, the, so many burdens that, uh, that make me so passionate to make sure that they don't happen to anybody else. Well, wow. but you've got your practice now, you're, you're up, you're running, you're, you're servicing the community, you're doing well. Um, what's, what's the biggest thing, and we can lead into the next segment with this, what are the biggest things you've learned um, from your practice and how it relates to the community. I mean, help me, help us understand what you see. Yeah. How do you see this? Well, you know, being on the front lines of, of, uh, of healthcare, being a provider, seeing mm -hmm. the symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, very close and upfront, and, um, and being able to see the, the circumstances that allow for these symptoms to be created mm -hmm. um, from a public health lens. Uh, it leads me to see, you know, patients coming into my office, uh, late 20 minutes. Oh, why were you late? Oh, mm. well, traffic. Oh, what what were you doing before then? Uh, how was your day? Oh, well, I had to drop off my kid uh, from X to Z and, uh, you know, um, along the way he was in trouble because of the, the school teacher mm -hmm. um, and, and, and uh, the parent would be some uh, a, a person of a marginalized background. Um, you know, we get to the, we get to, to actual treatment at that point and, and I start doing my diet, my, my, uh, my diagnosis and, and all of a sudden I see all these problems and, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, uh, how are all these problems coming together? And it has to do with the entire environment of it all. So they are connected, I'm thinking, and yes. um, that's why we're going to get into this, the next segment and talk a little bit more about your positions. Folks, uh, you've only heard just part one of my discussions with the candidate here. Come back uh, for our next segment, we'll get into more details. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. responsibility oh it's huge I know it's huge and the salary oh my god yes right? I mean like I was literally I was about to move in with my parents and <laughs> right before the yeah so this saved me I, I really believe in you you know thank you it's nice to hear that from someone <laughs> these are cool did you um what did
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Hi, folks. Cesar here, back with you and our guest, Dr. Ibrahim Samara, Samira, the Democratic candidate for the House 86th seat delegate uh, seat here. Coming up February 19. 19 is the special election. So, um, again, thanks for coming on. Let's talk a little bit about some of the initiatives, your sort of uh, things you want to champion going forward, because you see how this is all intertwined at, at your level. I mean, you see it from a provider perspective. You see the impact economically on people, the, the opportunities or lack of. So what, what are the things you want to champion? Yeah, well, I mean, it all goes back to my personal experiences, mm -hmm. having uh, so many, having dealt with so many of these issues personally. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 there's so many social woos now mm -hmm. in our society. A lot of things that are considered hot button issues, mm -hmm. um, different discriminations, racisms, uh, uh, different uh, uh, individual groups, identity groups, uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, rights being trampled on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I, I see it at its core. At its core, uh, at my dental practice, when people are coming in and I'm seeing them, I don't know what their political affiliation is. I don't know mm -hmm. where they come from. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all I have is, is you know, knowledge of what their oral hygiene condition is, and mm -hmm. and and, uh, and I ask uh, surrounding questions about it. And uh, it usually leads to core issues that have to do with transportation, that have to do mm -hmm. with healthcare, that have to do with education level, that have to do with housing, mm -hmm. uh, access to the right type of food. Uh, it, it, access to, to, to uh, uh, the needs, the everyday needs of people uh, uh, mm -hmm. that may or may not exist uh, at, at, a, at a high level for, yeah. for different individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I begin to question myself, why is this, why is this situation uh, so prevalent? Uh, and uh, I, come, I come to these conclusions uh, you know, fairly quickly that we do have a broken healthcare system. We mm -hmm. do have a broken education system. We have a broken transportation system. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't care about our environment uh, as, far, as far as our legislators and, and our government goes. Uh, we're not doing what's, what's right. And, and, it, and it, especially for the area that I come from in Herndon, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, Fairfax County, it's, it's part of Fairfax County, and everybody yep. here that's you know, watching for Fairfax County, Fairfax County is the second wealthiest county in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And right across Yet. from us, <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> and, and right, right across from us is Loudoun County yeah. as well, the wealthiest county in the sure. entire country. Mm -hmm. And yet we still have major pockets of poverty, yeah. uh, overcrowded housing, uh, uh, food shortages, uh, uh, food mm -hmm. deserts as, as they're called in, in, in the public health sector, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, underinsured uh, uh, individuals yeah. uh, at high levels. Or non-insured. Non-insured. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, that's a whole other story. Yeah. Uh, and, and education levels that are, are low. And you, you, you start to look at the, the details and the fine-tunes. Yes, the average income is very high where we live. Uh, but but you, you betcha, if you don't start focusing on those issues, uh, of those the people that are marginalized, the people mm -hmm. that are not getting the best health care, education, transportation, right. uh, uh, best everything that they we could possibly have here in our counties here and mm -hmm. uh, in particular in, in Herndon, then we're going to have trouble mm -hmm. uh, 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 for everybody. It's, it's all interconnected. It's all interwoven. Uh, and if, if uh, we don't start acting now, uh, then it's a problem. And that's where my inspiration comes in, to jump into the field uh, of governance to provide that personal feedback both from a professional perspective as a healthcare provider, knowing how insurance companies work, knowing how they rip off everyday people, how they rip me off as a provider as well, uh, uh, and uh, knowing how that's all intertwined with the greater medical industry, not just in dentistry. Uh, and it, it goes right into the, the, uh, the topic of, uh, of, of insurance for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we cover everybody's healthcare costs? And uh, you know, for me, it starts at uh, uh, my knowledge of, of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one cornerstone of, of my uh, agenda for, for the uh, state of Virginia. Mm -hmm. As a legislator, I want to be put into laws that encourage individuals uh, to jump into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, the individual mandate was uh, attacked uh, by uh, President Trump. Uh, but we have a duty on us, on ourselves here in, on the local level, uh, mm -hmm. at the state level, to, to make up for that. Uh, and uh, not just on that front, but also a lot of other smaller laws that 
uh, that protect individuals uh, when they're transitioning from one job to another, uh, that prevent uh, uh, what I would call uh, bluntly a fake health insurance plan uh, mm -hmm. from existing, uh, that gets people out of uh, uh, getting the real health care that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and in, in turn, uh, we would be encouraging insurance companies to compete with each other better. Uh, it, would, it would create uh, better business opportunities for these insurance companies because there's more individuals jumping in. Mm -hmm. uh, it would create qu higher quality uh, health insurance plans uh, that would be as a result of this, uh, this competition. And that would reduce the burden on the state's budget for health care. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would increase the services that are money that we're also spending right now on health care, uh, uh, the Medicaid expansion money. It would be spent much better and, and uh, a lot more people would get uh, uh, health care out of it. We have a duty upon ourselves to, to, to focus on these things. Yeah, I, I think at the core, we're treating the symptoms, right? Right. But ultimately, somewhere someone has to have, and it's not at your level or even at the state level, but there's just a systemic issue with a for-profit healthcare delivery uh -huh. system, uh -huh. Uh -huh. right? I mean, uh, for me, that's like, that's the big, big, like elephant in the room. Until we deal with that, we're gonna be left to these sort of like minimal sort of patches. And, and I think that's, I mean, I, I think Virginia is leading the way in that. And, and certainly, I think you're on the right path there. Uh, but ultimately, someone's gotta, deal with that big elephant how, how and and if we as a society want a for-profit then we're just going to have to admit to everyone that only rich people can get health care and if you're fine with that so be it but I mean that's I think the discussion that uh, I think sure. and I don't I don't think anybody's fine with it uh, <laughs> but, you know, but, but even until people we that are well it. off they yeah. don't you don't want uh, your your emergency rooms packed up. You don't right. want uh, because emergency rooms are funded by uh, right. state funds well, and federal yeah. funds, right. and uh, you don't want that to happen right. because that's going to raise your taxes. And again, that's a reaction to something, right? right? If someone does a little bit of preventive, routine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dental checkups, mm -hmm. they avoid the more costly items down the road, right? I mean, a little ounce of prevention Absolutely. here, right? Absolutely. So that's that's the public health perspective that's very important in our in our society to enable people to also have preventative measures. Yeah. Uh, if if somebody has two jobs and has three kids that uh, they're struggling to put food on the table for and they have to raise mm -hmm. them right and they're more concerned about their moral character and their uh, how, how their grades are doing, they're, yeah. you, 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 they're not probably not going to come to their appointment. And right. They're probably going to miss it. Uh, they're mm -hmm. probably not going to get their health checkup every year. Uh, right. They're probably going to develop high blood pressure. Uh, they're probably going to have so many other troubles happening as a result of that and, and shortened lifespan. Mm -hmm. Their kids are getting less uh, right. care as a result of that. Systemic diseases yeah. develop from that, right. not just in terms of the, per the physical health, but the societal health, uh, uh, the family health. Uh, and these are all cornerstones to our society to be able to present a society that is a model society uh, for the rest of the country where we have a duty to utilize our wealth to provide the best and to not just be a model uh, uh, for ourselves, but for the rest of Virginia and the country at large. We shouldn't have to think about how Europe is doing so much, so much better yeah. in the healthcare sector <laughs> uh, uh, than it's we are. It's a different system. <laughs> it's a different system, right. totally. Right. And, and I think you touched on one of the points. For me, uh, we're going to talk about it in the, the, with the next guest, but touch on it a little bit. Housing. Right. We have a high income average in the county relative to the country, yet people are spending more than what they should for housing, right? But, but we also have a shortage of, of housing mm -hmm. in the area. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with that? How do we fix that at, at, at the levels? I mean, what is it that, because all this, because if I don't have enough for my rent, you know, I'm gonna kind of take from here and take from there and maybe I won't go for my care visit. Maybe I won't, you know, spend it on sure. an, another class sure. or a tutor or something. Absolutely. And, so, and, and I do want to lead in with, with sort of some statistics about the degree of over overcrowded housing that we have sure. uh, in, in Herndon. Well, yeah, 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 that's, yeah that's, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's for the area that I'm um, going to hopefully representing uh, starting February 20th. And, um, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, right here for this, there's oh, 23 census tracts where more than 10% of the residents mm -hmm. of Herndon are living in 
housing that is considered overcrowded right. by Virginia Commonwealth University study called Getting Ahead, oh, yeah. uh, the uneven opportunity landscape in Northern Virginia. And we have ordinances that don't allow that type of overcrowding. Absolutely. So w what you're doing is you're saying, I mean, I, 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 get, I get all sides of this, right? I mean, but that's the problem, right? People aren't doing it because they want to. They have to. Exactly. They have to, and, and so, they want to be around their families, their, their, right. their, their relatives. Uh, if we can't address the problem, if we can't talk about it out loud, and if we keep getting this, uh, the, keep uh, moving the stereotype that Northern Virginia They're is evil. so wealthy yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, has so much money, and, and we're thinking about the big houses, the big nice houses that we see every now and then, yeah. uh, you know, that, that's not going to uh, do us any justice in pursuing yeah. that objective of, of decreasing overcrowded housing yeah. uh, percentages. Where that starts? Well, it starts first off by addressing the reality, which is there's a lot of money in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hate, I hate to bring it back to that, but when, when you have uh, influencers, when you have developers who are pushing for higher priced housing, right. uh, it's within their interest right, uh, to course. have uh, overcrowded housing uh, and uh, the, uh, the, ca the housing that's, that's cheaper because they want to you know, strangle those areas as much as possible, decrease their, right. their, re their, their prevalence. And so that leads to overcrowded housing. And those overcrowded housings then become, to, then come, uh, uh, start increasing in prices. Right. Uh, so if we can't put a check on that right off the bat, then you can't expect your government government to protect yeah. you in the realm of housing. Yeah, and I don't completely blame, to your point, I don't blame the developers because they want to build high profit margin. Absolutely. Unit. I mean, that's just, but you have to, as an elected official, balance that with the needs of the community. And that goes both yeah. ways also. Yeah. The individual that was living there for 20 years, when their house has become you know, uh, 10 times the value that they buy it, bought right. it at. I mean, they're, they're making uh, an income too that, that, yeah. that could get them a retirement plan. And but then they have to sell it to right. cover the increases in taxes because they're on a fixed income. I mean, the, the tapestry. Layers. Yeah, this, this tapestry. But it's strangling. That's what we know, and, yeah. and, and it's, this, it's this, the, the system itself. And if we're able to provide more funding for, for lower income housing, uh, if we're able to address that issue to start with, about how can we solve that? It doesn't need to be labeled lower income housing. It just needs to be strategized better. Uh, we need to have uh, uh, more uh, zoning uh, for for different types of uh, houses that don't have to be one type or the other. Uh, 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 and and uh, that way we can expand uh, our our housing markets for everybody and make it cheaper for everybody. And that's where we're going to stop. We'll have you back on, folks. Please check out Ibrahim's uh, website, Facebook pages. He is an incredible candidate, and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. We'll be back. Gotcha. <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's up? Do we have a gun? Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, but now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. What to expect when you're expecting. Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to team-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the- Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. 
You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Hi, folks. Cesar here, back with our next uh, guest. I, I thought it important to have this uh, person come join us uh, to talk about one of the issues certainly I'm passionate about addressing. Uh, our next guest, uh, Ken McMillian. Um, he'll share with you, but uh, just so you know a little bit about him, he was homeless from 2004 to 2007. Um, as a result of that, he worked on and with uh, Jerry, Congressman Jerry Conley's uh, plan to end homelessness. And I think that's a 10 year plan. He finally got into housing in 2007, and he became a member of the Fairfax County Citizens Again Citizens Action Advisory Board, CAB as many people know it, from 2012 to present. Uh, he also won a Virginia Peters Award for housing as an advocate uh, in 2018. Mr. McMillian, thank you so much for coming on the show. Pleased to be here. This is a very, very dear and uh, important uh, issue for me. I can imagine it's equally as important to you. I wanted to take a couple segments to dedicate to this issue because for me, I see it as a, as a growing problem. It's not going away. No. It's not going away anytime soon. So briefly, uh, kind of give us a little bit of background of, of your experience, how you came. Um, if, if you'd like to share that, you know, what, what led to your, your homelessness condition, how, how you got out the struggles. Just on a personal note, if you're comfortable sharing some of that. Well, it was an accident, not by choice. Um, mm -hmm. Losing both of my parents, um, who were immense providers and gave me, they were activists too. Uh, my father in 2000 and my mother in 2004. Uh, unfortunately, when my mother passed away, I had moved in. I left my job at the Department of Veteran Affairs to take care of her. Um, was not going to let her go into a, a home, a nursing home. I had mm. seen what happens there, and, and my mother didn't deserve that. Oh, God bless her. So uh, taking care of her because everything that I am is because of my father mm. and my mother, mm. a labor construction worker and a maid. And uh, they provided everything we ever needed. Uh, and education-wise, I've been able to become a lot of things, a firefighter, a surveyor, uh, worked for Tri-State Dynamite Bill in Roslyn, uh, mm -hmm. uh, wastewater plant operator, uh, a detective for retail, and then uh, working at a big box store and rose from there after I was homeless, rose from there because I started working there when I was homeless, uh, to a supervisor and sometimes a store manager at the time, a system manager. So um, being homeless, I didn't imagine that that would ever happen to me because yeah. as a musician, I wrote a song about a guy, a homeless guy, mm -hmm. and then I became that song. So it was important for me to use everything I could to get out of that. And then once I was into it and started a little bit more than from the face, you know, getting deep into it, becoming that myself, I realized that there are struggles that are being made. Uh, one of the most important things is that people think that all homeless people have some kind of problem before. Yeah. Alcoholism, drugs, mentalism, uh, uh, a whole lot of other things. But when you think about it, me personally, I became a mental problem because depression hit me for the three years that I was homeless. I couldn't imagine how I got here and then trying to think of how I was gonna get there. But the whole time you're living in the street and trying to keep warm, trying to find out where your next meal is coming from, you can't think about anything else. It is so consuming that despair becomes your best friend, mm -hmm. your only friend. So uh, once I was able to get my foothold and get out of there, I looked back on what was causing the problem for homeless. And that resorted into figuring out, hey, housing is a problem. Mm -hmm. Even if you're talking about low income uh, or Section 8, it's still a problem. It's a problem for so many people who cannot get to be where they should be or they could be. You think about my mother and father, as I told you what their occupations were, they bought their first house in 64 and lived in that house until they passed away. Mm -hmm. That 
that narrative is disappearing now. Sure. They were renting. Normally, you rent, you save up enough money, you buy a house or you make a down payment on a house, and right. then you move on from there. Right. But that part of the equation is no longer there now. Right. People right. cannot get from the rental part to the owner part. That's right. And then uh, there are all kind of other obstacles. You touched on it with your previous guest uh, about some of the things that prevent people from getting there. We have the nimbyism, not in my backyard. We need a lot more people, yes, in my backyard, which is YIMBYism. Mm -hmm. um, we have zones. We have uh, uh, certain laws that keep us from, from building houses where they should be. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's an uphill battle. So that's pretty much about it. Well, that, I, I got to, I, <laughs> again, thank you for coming on uh, to share your story and, and talk about this topic. For me, it's... Um, it's people like you that need to continually voice the reality. Because for those that have never been homeless, you know, certainly I saw the struggles of my parents worry about paying the rent. Yeah. And that is stressful, especially, you know, when the, the food stamps, you know, don't translate to rent, <laughs> right? Or, and, and, you know, they don't put the medical bills or, or, you know, books or clothes or stuff like that. So, I mean, I... I've seen it, but I've not lived it. And I think the more people that can empathize and then understand to be inspired to do something about it, uh, that's, that's what I'm asking for people like you to continually do. So don't stop this, this thing that we're talking about here. I have no intention. Though. Good, <laughs> good. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about, um, do, you, do you now, you live uh, in, in the area? Yes. You live in Fairfax County? I do. Okay. What was it like to finally get an opportunity to have your place again, have, have your own place? What was that like? Well, first, I didn't want to be there. I was mm -hmm. the first person who, under the Fairfax County of our plan of ending homelessness, housing first. Mm -hmm. In other words, no matter what the person's condition is or what may have brought them into homelessness, mm -hmm. if you stop worrying about that and getting them into housing, you can fix the other things that may have caused that, mm -hmm. hopefully. For me, I figured there are people that have been ho uh, homeless for a long period of time. But one of my dearest friends convinced me that if this was to be successful, I had a better chance of achieving that than mm -hmm. the other people. And only when he brought it down to that level did I say, okay, yeah, this is, this is bigger than me. This is not about me, it's about the others. Mm -hmm. So I got in, two-year plan. I did about a month, I mean, a, about a year and maybe two months and said, I'm done. I got a job, I can pay for it, let someone else take that. And from that point on, I was able to work up the ladder because I had employment and everything like that. But as I was moving up the ladder, mm -hmm. I realized I'm at a place now where I'm a little bit comfortable, mm -hmm. but not all the way there. Mm -hmm. One small problem, mm -hmm. sickness, uh, uh, injury or anything like that, mm -hmm. and I'm back where I started at. I began to look at other people being in that same position. Luckily for me, I only had to work one job. Right. One mm -hmm. of my subordinates that worked for me you know, lived in my building. I already knew how much the rent was that I was paying, for, for living there, and I realized, you know, there's probably no chance of me ever owning a home at where I am at now, mm -hmm. and how much time at my age I'm going to be. I asked them one day, hey, how, how are you surviving? Well, I'm working three jobs. Mm -hmm. Three jobs? Yeah. All of them part-time. Mm -hmm. And his wife was working, his two kids were working, and his uh, in-laws all came here from Iran, Iran. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it, that's got to be tough. So mm -hmm. I talked to my manager, I said, we got to do something about this. We mm -hmm. cannot let this guy, you know, how much time is he spending with his family? You know, mm -hmm. the big part of your achieving, like your previous guest was, you know, that family narrative, you right. know. And if you can't do that, the children, everybody's suffering. Mm -hmm. So we made him full time. But that doesn't help the uh, item, and, you know. And I said, why are you not paying a lease? He said, he's renting from month to month, which is higher. Right. 
He wants to be able to afford a house when it comes. That's yeah. never going to happen. Right. It's never going to happen. Right. So, right. like you said, you know, it's important that we let people know some of the struggles that people are going through. And we're not even, we haven't even touched Section 8. Right. When we talk about low income, we're not talking about Section 8. We're not talking yeah. about subsidies. Right. We're talking about people just barely making it and not going anyplace else. It's, it's the majority of the workforce, the way I call it. It's the workforce is where the shortage is. Correct. Right. And, and you can argue, you can have a discussion. I've had this with people. They try to say that, well, you know, if they pay a little bit more, they'll get there. But you have to think, if I make $100 a month, it's just, just for numbers, know, it's 100%, right? And 80% is going to my rent, I'm never going to be able to save and invest in the other things I need to lead a, a successful, productive life. And that is where my, my focus is, right? Because if you're spending more than, I think, you know, some will say 25 to 30% on living accommodations, you're not in a position of strength or security or being comfortable to invest in these other areas. The federal government has what we call an AMI, which is the average monthly income. Mm -hmm. Legally and economically, you cannot spend more than 30% right. of your entire income to housing. Anything <laughs> more? It, <laughs> well, <laughs> we know, like uh, you just said, a lot of people are still paying more than that. Yeah. But I just went to a, 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 a focal point from the Center for American Progress this past Thursday uh, in D.C. They bought five mirrors across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. And one of the questions that I asked them was, how does minimum wage affect your ability to have housing? And guess what? This is going to surprise you. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah, they didn't say that minimum wage is a problem because these are places where everybody, these mayors and their, their uh, municipality, everybody's way above minimum wage. Yeah. Some at $13, $14 an hour. Yeah. And it still doesn't help. The problem is housing has not increased with the amount of people who need housing. Right. Yeah, that's that's the big <laughs> that's the bigger issue. I'm glad we're so we're going to come back in our next segment and talk about that. But yes. that that's another issue. It's not only the the cost; it's the amount, and it's it's overtaxed as far as I'm concerned. So, folks, um, please join us. Come back in the next segment. We'll uh, finish off this rather important topic. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help. And slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> selfies, nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. Dad is an adventure full of special moments. A cruise! Ooh. Right! Unexpected moments. I got this. And even awkward moments. Okay, Dad, thank you. <laughs> but every moment you spend with your kids, <laughs> even the smallest moments, <laughs> can make the biggest impact on your child's life. So take a moment to be a dad today. <laughs> So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? 
That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide and go seek. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Hi, folks. Cesar here, back with our guest, Ken McMillan. Not McMillian. Um, I was going to give him a million, but uh, he turned it down. <laughs> Sir, thank you for staying. Um, oh, and uh, during the break, uh, we had a call from, uh, uh, I'm reading, we had a call from Fred in Herndon. Uh, the housing that's going up in Herndon. Um, Let's talk. Let's table that for a second, because you actually had experience. Herndon's getting development off the Silver Line of the Metro. There was some some development going on in Arlington, and where the blue and the oranges converged. Correct. Correct. So help me understand a little bit about that, and how that was impacted. So, in Arlington, you know the housing shortfall, and we talk yeah. about a shortfall because when you think about housing that's affordable. What's missing with the equation? The equation is we have more people who are in what we call a middle income or lower income class that are working. They're not looking for Section 8, but right. we don't have the housing that right. we can put them in. Yeah. So what do you do? Your people density has increased bigger than your housing Correct. density has. Yeah. Okay, so obviously when you have things like that, you have your single home families, okay, but there's not a lot of land mass. So what you do is you have zones and, 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 and zoning and, and other rules and regulations that don't allow you to build multi-use buildings. Right. You may be able to get a multi-use family home, but when you start talking about renters, everybody can't afford right. a monthly income for a house, but they can't afford a rental unit for an apartment or something like that. So normally you build up. Mm -hmm. Then you have the people, well, I don't want you to destroy my view. But when they knew that the blue line and the orange line were coming in Arlington, yeah, yeah. they were able to do that. Mm -hmm. So they had maybe about 300 homes, rental units in Arlington. And what they did was they were able to, to get, only lose about a third of those, which kept the others in rental units until they could build up. Mm -hmm. You've got Herndon, which is now getting ready to get development for your, your silver line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they don't take the opportunity to build up instead of outward, because you don't have the land to do so, mm -hmm. and you've got these zonings and, and these restricted areas, you've got your parks, you know, and things like that, mm -hmm. you're going to have a problem. People migrate because if you're trying to rent, there's a good likelihood you have a car but that car is costing you gas and everything like that. So you need to be close to transportation. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that the thinking of developers is when you get, want to get close to transportation, you start thinking about townhouses and mansions right. and, and, and condos yeah. that are way out of the class. Yeah. And so what you have is, like your first guest here said, you have multiple families living in one place. Right. What kind of quality of life is that? You know, you, 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 you're, you're sharing a... Well, it, that's, that's <laughs> old world living, by the way. My family, there's a lot of people to one house. But you're right, that's not traditionally the American, the American way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to your point, I've actually had these discussions. How much density is appropriate for each area? Because in some areas of the county, you're just not going to get any density sure. to allow for what the county needs, and that is more units at this level, not Section Eight. Correct. Right. I'm yeah, not I'm talking. Begin to talk. Right, right. I mean that whole. That's a different narrative. Yeah. Uh, minimum wage. Not that we're going to forget about that. Right. We we can't. Right. right. But like, I, I feel like these are conflated segments that we talk about because. Uh, on what we're, what I am, you are talking about is people that have jobs, they have incomes, but in order to obtain housing, they're going beyond what they should be, yeah. because then they can't afford an impact of another unforeseen, either illness or or some other thing. Right, one paycheck away from being homeless. Yeah. That's what we define most people, and. Just so people understand this, it goes from your 
your restaurant workers, mm -hmm. your people who are working in fast food industries, to your, your, the clerk that you see when you go into a doctor's office, the person mm -hmm. that's taking your name and setting up your appointment and things like that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about your nurses in your hospitals. We're talking about your police officers, yeah, your firefighters, yeah. your teachers, okay? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I would like for the county to do is I would really like to know how many of those people working for the county or any municipality actually are living in the county. That number is low. Think about that. That number is low. If your revenue is based on your, the people who are paying taxes here and the people right. that you're paying wages to are working for you and right. they can't find affordable living and they're That's moving right. further out, it has another contributing problem, which is? That's right. Global warming, yeah, yeah, because their carbon <laughs> footprint right. on the amount of traffic. If you're complaining right. about having to drive yeah. on Route 66 yeah. and pay a toll fee because you're living, right. you know, way, then where would you move to? Move to the places where the transportation is so you don't right. have to do that. That's but right. if you can't afford to do that, what are you going to do? That's right. You're not given a choice. So it's a, it's a combination of a right. lot of different issues that people have broad brushed over the years. Right. When you talk about housing, uh, Arlington and some parts of Alexandria have gone and done bonds, okay? Bonds allow us to have the tax dollars set in, set away, set aside the money, and then get developers who come in and on that bond, we're actually making money off of that, but we're also using that money in a more profitable way for economic development and equity development for all people to rise up. And I can assure you with one mayor telling me that it cost you probably about 75% less to keep someone in their place by paying off a few bills that they have and getting them so that they become evil, even king as opposed to letting that person fall out and become evicted and then completely right. homeless. Oh, sure. Okay? 75% savings in just doing that. But then again, if they don't have any place else to go, we still have the problem. Sure. So this, you know, we have to take a positive look. The, the surveys and, and the, the, uh, um, the ideas that we think of and do are not nearly enough. We have a lot of people who are smarter than me. I'm pulling for research. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm doing the grunt work here. Mm -hmm. But we know that it's not working. But how long are we going to wait? The, the needs assessment which I, which I worked on that came out in 2016 said we had a lack of about 31,000 units. In the county. In the county yeah. only. Yeah. Remember, yeah. we started that in probably 2015. I, I, just want, I want people at home to hear and absorb that number. There's a shortage, <laughs> and this is an estimate, of 31,000, not people, no. units. but units across the, the, the one of the county. richest counties in the country. That is, it's not just, it's, it's sad, right? It was like- and That was 2016, oh, we're yeah, now in 2019. Oh, that number has grown. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's probably blown up. See, I think this, this is such a, a big, big problem. And I, I think everyone owns a little piece of it. it. It's not only the elected, it's the developers, it's the people that plan and zone things not taking this into consideration, then letting developers, and Ooh. again, yeah, Ooh. I'm all for <laughs> profit. I, you know, as a shareholder of life, I want that, but there's gotta be a balance. You Common know, there's ground. gotta be a balance here. Um, Fairfax City, a couple of years yeah. ago, I was surprised because the mayor, the, was, the used to be mayor, came out publicly and said, we fail. They had three, sets of garden apartments that they allowed to be sold and then redeveloped where all those garden apartments, rental units, where people, I know people that lived there and had to move out because of that, that they sold to developers and those places are gone. Yeah. Those are part of the 31,000 that are left. Sure. But the last one, because they had not already signed the paperwork, they said, that's it. We renege on this, we're, we're not doing it. You're gonna have to either present you're going to have to set aside some of that, those units mm -hmm. for affordability for yeah. our residents. That's right. First time I ever heard a mayor ever say that publicly, no. okay? No. So right now, across from where I'm living, they're building a multi-use commercial, retail, and, you know, rental units right at Fairfax Circle. They're working on it now. 
okay? Mm -hmm. I don't know when it will be finished, but the, the, the problem that is, has not been finished yet is because it's in Fairfax City, but there were parts mm -hmm. of it that go to Fairfax County, and then yeah. Fairfax County had to get involved. So that was another hurdle. But you're absolutely right. We have to do a little bit more, and we have to do it at a faster rate than what we're doing it. And we have a survey that's coming out that all Fairfax County residents can fill out and join that survey. If you don't know it, you can go to fairfaxcounty.gov mm -hmm. and look for a survey, and then you can put your opinion in for that. All yeah. right, so I'm going to give you another yeah. little, little okay. insight, here, <laughs> and I'm going to help you with this, <coughs> because there's an election this year, right? <laughs> and there's a lot of seats on the Board of Supervisors, including the chair, that people are going to want your vote. And if this is an issue that people care about, I want you to ask your candidates, supervisors around the county where they stand on this issue and what their vision is for fixing this 31,000 shortage. And let's just call it 35,000 today because I'm okay, sure it went up a little higher, more. Yeah. So, and if you need those names and numbers, I'm going to work <laughs> with you. We're going we're gonna to make a dent in this because this is, it's only going to get worse. Right? It's only going to get worse because we're not doing enough now, right. and the growth in, in, the P, in the need is going to continue to grow. There are a couple of things. First, I want to let you in on something. We, in the uh, 2016 needs assessment, one of the growing population coming back into Fairfax County was what group of people would you think? Uh, probably kids coming home to live with their parents. Nope. Oh, then I give up. Senior citizens. Really? Okay. Not only senior citizens is one of the growing rates of people in the density here, mm -hmm. uh, but they're also coming back into the city. Okay. Probably because too far away from hospitals and medical care, mm -hmm. or they can't afford to live where they're living and they come back to living with kids. Okay. Oh, okay. So, in thinking of that, the other way. Okay. The other way around, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, with that, it's very important that the people who are coming on board, Kathy Hutchins, oh, I love that woman. Love her, love her. She's she has done so much for Reston and I think Herndon. she's retiring this year. She is retiring yeah. this year. There are at least, I know of two, I think there's possible three or four candidates that are running for the Providence District, I mean, for the, for the Providence District, but there are a couple of more that are running for Herndon and Reston. Yeah. So, yes, and this delegate here that you were talking about. So you Ken, need to contact sir, them. Thank you so much. We are going to make a dent in this, I, 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 I promise you. Folks, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I hope this uh, inspired some folks to get out there and, and make their choices based on this issue. Going forward, we'll have information on the website, and uh, we'll catch you for the next.